Good evening. Welcome. We are delighted that you chose to be a part of this study on today. Uh, we are grateful to God for all that he does in our lives. And we want to talk about friendship today. Well, we are blessed in our lives to have people that we can call friends. And it is our prayer that we are friends to those around us. And friendship is one of these ideas, one of these concepts that we don't talk about very often. Uh, it is something that we all kind of assume people get, but we want to look at friendship today from a biblical perspective. And it's our prayer that God will speak to you through this lesson uh, as we are challenged and encouraged to be better friends. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is once again we come before your throne just thankful for your love, for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you for who you are, what you do in our lives each and every day. We ask that you will continue to comfort our hearts, that you will heal our world, protect us, and keep us safely. In Jesus' name, amen. On tonight, we'll be in Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 24, and we're going to focus in on verse number uh, 23, Acts chapter 24, verse number 23. But before we do that, I want to give you a little context for uh, Acts 24, uh, verse number 23, just so we get a feel for where we are in the text, what we will be studying in the text. So in Acts chapter 24, uh, the context actually begins in uh, chapter 21, where Paul is under attack for the cause of Christ, and he's visiting Jerusalem. And when he's visiting Jerusalem, he meets with James, and he meets with the elders of the church there in Jerusalem. And he shares with them uh, the things that God is doing through his ministry, the things that God is doing in his life. And the Bible tells us that when James and the elders heard this, that they praised God. Uh, it is good when other Christians can celebrate what God is doing in the lives of someone else. Uh, it's not all about what God is doing in me, but we praise God for what he's doing in you, for what he's doing through you. And so uh, they celebrated the success of Paul and James and the elders, they tell Paul to purify himself. They advise him, hey, uh, there are some rumors that you are sp uh, speaking against the customs and practices of Judaism. And so to put those rumors to rest, why don't you purify yourself according to the law of Moses? So uh, Paul does this. He agrees and he begins the purification process. And after a period of purification is over, Paul goes to the temple. Uh, and at the temple, some of the Jews from Asia, they get people all stirred up and agitated by accusing Paul of defiling the temple. And the people capture Paul, they drag him out of the temple, and they begin to beat him, and their plan is to kill him. Uh, the news of this riotous behavior reaches the Roman authorities who send troops in order to restore the city of Jerusalem to order. Uh, they arrest Paul and under heavy military escort, they take him to their barracks. Uh, once Paul is in custody, he's granted permission to speak to the people. And so when he grants, he's granted this permission to speak to the people, what do you think Paul does? Uh, Paul shares the gospel. He shares his story of conversion to Christianity with the crowd that's gathered outside of the army barracks, but the crowd really doesn't appreciate Paul's message. And so the commander of the Roman soldiers uh, is about to have Paul flogged and interrogated. Uh, and then Paul says that I'm a citizen of Rome and I'm being treated unfairly. Uh, the Roman commander, uh, he wants to get down to the bottom of things to figure out why Paul is being accused of the Jews. Paul, uh, he's before, brought before the Sanhedrin. 
which is the same council that was responsible for criminalizing Jesus. And the Sanhedrin cannot agree on what crime Paul has committed because he really didn't commit a crime. And so the next day, more than 40 Jews, they get together to conspire to kill Paul. And they make an agreement that they won't eat or drink until Paul is killed. And so they they get with the chief priests and the elders and they tell them to get with the Sanhedrin and act like uh, you all want to get some more accurate information about this case. And their plan is while Paul is going to be transported uh, from the barracks to uh, the council that this group of people will ambush the convoy and kill Paul. And so the commander gets wind of this plot and he assigns 470 military personnel to get Paul out of town that night. And so uh, we, uh, we come to Acts chapter 24 uh, and we, we get a chance to see uh, what the commander is doing. We see uh, what God is doing. We, give, we have the instructions. And as we come to Acts 24, the Bible says, he gave orders to the centurion, uh, gave orders to the centurion, centurion for him to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. Uh, so, so what happens here is that uh, Paul goes on this journey uh, from uh, this from Jerusalem uh, to Caesarea. And in Caesarea, Philip, Felix is the governor there in Caesarea. And Felix hears the case against Paul. He hears the defense. The Bible tells us in Acts 24, 22, that Felix is well acquainted with the way or with the church. And he dismisses the proceedings indicating uh, that he was waiting on Lysias, uh, the commander who had sent Paul to him in the first place before he decided Paul's case. Uh, and so uh, it's at this point, we come to our context for verse number 23, uh, that Felix gives orders to the centurion uh, to keep Paul in custody and yet give Paul some freedom not to prevent his friends from ministering to him. This is an interesting idea uh, here. Uh, Felix says, don't keep Paul's friends from ministering to him. When we think of friendship, we don't often think of friendship in terms of ministry. Uh, but true friendship involves ministry. True friendship, friendship involves ministry. The Holy Spirit is very careful in his selection of words that he inspires Luke uh, to utilize here. Uh, when, he, when he talks about friend and not to let, uh, stop Paul's friends from ministering to him. Uh, well, the word friend is often a translation of the Greek word phylos, uh, which is used 29 of the 33 times that the word friend appears in the New Testament. But here, the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to use the word idios. And uh, this is the only verse where this word is translated as friend. Uh, the word literally means one's own, one's own. Uh, and he says, don't keep his friends, his own, from ministering to him. The, this, this concept of ministry here is to serve at the will of another. It refers to one who willingly learns a task uh, from one who is over him. And so uh, in friendship, we willingly and freely obligate ourselves to another person, uh, willingly and freely obligate ourselves to another person. Now, how many of us actually think of friendship 
as an obligation. How many of us think of it as ministry? But but it is. That's the essence of oh, the word here is as I minister to my friends, I serve them. I do it freely. Um, I, I, in essence, belong to my friend. Uh, my friend is my own and I belong to my friend. And, and that suggests that friendship requires submission. Friendship requires submission. I have to be willing to put myself aside for my friend. And the reason some people don't make good friends is because they don't know how to submit. Uh, that's why uh, people don't make good spouses, don't make good church members, they don't make good friends because they have an issue with submitting. They want to run the show. They uh, expect you to do what they want you to do. Uh, but you can't ask the same of them. Uh, they want things done on their schedule, but they won't be flexible in their schedule to accommodate you. you. They want you to be there for them, but they're not there for you. But true friendship requires mutual submission. Uh, and friendship is a ministry. And there are at least three areas of ministry where we should be friends uh, to one another, three areas of ministry that we should engage in as we uh, are seeking to be friends to one another. And, and the first one is the ministry of comfort. Uh, and that's what we see here in the text. We see this ministry of comfort. Paul is being held captive by the Romans. Uh, he, he, he is captive, but his friends are free to come and comfort him in his crisis. Uh, you may recall in 2 Timothy chapter four, Paul, as he is near the end of his life, tells Timothy to come to him and bring him some of the things that will make his last days more comfortable. Uh, and he details how other people that he considered his friend were not there for him. Uh, but he calls on Timothy because Timothy is reliable. Timothy was dependable and it's good to have someone that you can call on who can come to your aid in the midst of your agony uh, as a friend you don't always have to say the right thing you don't always have to answer uh, your friends uh, questions to with precision you don't have to be able to solve every one of your friends problems many times your presence alone is comfort. Uh, there is a ministry of comfort that we should be involved in, uh, helping a friend care for a sick loved one, uh, being there to support a friend who has small children but does not really have anyone that they trust to watch their children. You can be there for them. You can be a friend by uh, visiting a, a friend's parents in the hospital by assisting with funeral arrangements for a friend's relatives. You can, you can stay connected to your friend after the funeral, especially around the holidays and other days of importance. That's what friends are for. You, you engage in this ministry of comfort. You, you keep your eyes open and you're actively helping your uh, unemployed friend find a job. You are engaging your friend and encouraging your friend to stay in there and to stick it out when it's tough to stick it out. That's what friends are for, this ministry of comfort. And we should seek to be there for other people in their time of need. There's the ministry of comfort that friends engage in. There's also the ministry of conscience. Uh, the ministry of conscience. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 27, verses 5 through 6, better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Uh, see, a real friend will not sit idly by and do nothing while you continue down a path of destruction, uh, but rather a friend will do what they can to awaken your conscience. 
uh, the New Century Version for uh, this same text says, the slap of a friend can be trusted to help you, but the kisses of an enemy are nothing but lies. Uh, friends often have to snap their friends back into reality. Uh, friends don't tell you what you want to hear. They tell you what you need to hear. They love you enough to tell you the truth. Sometimes a friend has to wound your spirit in order to save your soul. They may uh, end up hurting your feelings and it's not uh, anything malicious or intentional. Uh, sometimes we can be hurt when people speak the truth into our lives, but friends are there to rebuke us. They are there uh, to be our conscience. When we're not right in the situation, a friend will tell us, hey, you, you weren't right. You could have handled that better. Uh, that's what friends are for. Uh, friends engage in this ministry of conscience or this ministry of conviction. I am there to help convict my friend that hey, you missed the mark on this one, or there's another perspective, there's another way of looking at this situation that you may not have thought of. And when we bring our friends to conviction, we help restore them back to a right relationship with God and a right relationship with others. And so we engage in this ministry of conviction, this ministry of conscience to help sound the alarm so that our friends don't have their consciences dulled and seared with a hot iron. And then finally, friends engage in the ministry of companionship. Proverbs uh, 17 and seven, a friend loves at all times, and a brother's born for adversity. Uh, 1717, Proverbs 1717, a friend loves at all times, and a brother's born for adversity. As humans, we are relational creatures. We desire, we need relationships. Uh, we are created for relationships. Uh, John Don writes in part, no man is an island entire to itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. We were not made to be alone. We were made for companionship. Uh, that means that uh, I must be willing to step outside of myself and get over myself so that I can experience life through a lens other than my own so that I can talk with others and walk with others. The joys of life are multiplied when you have someone with whom to share them. Uh, friends are there for companionship. Friends weep when you weep and they rejoice when you rejoice, they, they will stand by you at your wedding. They will celebrate you uh, as you welcome a new child into your family. They, they'll, they'll take you out to eat and congratulate you on a promotion on your job or a new job. They will, will spend time with you, invest in the relationship, share hobbies with you. They'll get excited because you got blessed with a new car or a new house. A friend loves at all times, uh, and a brother is born for adversity. So companionship says, I'm not just there when times are good, but I'll be with you when times are difficult. I will be like a brother to you. For good times and bad times and happy times and sad times, that's what friends are for. Friends engage in the ministry of comfort. They engage in the ministry of conviction or conscience, and they engage in the ministry of companionship. Uh, have you been a good friend lately? Uh, have you been there for others when they needed you? Or are you there and available for others to engage in these ministries? Uh, think about it, reflect on it, uh, share this message, talk about it with uh, others around you. Think through how you can be a better friend. What are some concrete steps that you will begin to take so that you can be the friend that other people need. This friend who engages in the ministry of comfort, the ministry of conviction, the ministry of companionship, not just expecting this from other people, but giving other people an opportunity to experience what a true friend 
really does and who a true friend really is. In your time in prayer, and it's our prayer that God will bring us together real soon. In the meantime, be a friend, be a blessing to others, engage in this ministry of comfort, ministry of conviction, ministry of companionship.